wanted to build this product that would be easily integrated into existing toilets. Uh, we wanted to have automated features and a completely touchless operation uh, that would improve hygiene and convenience in any bathroom. Uh, and we wanted it very easy so that you don't have to actually take out a toilet. You could just replace parts of your existing toilet. Come up, you're ready to use it. You would interact with it by draping your hand over the top. The seat would then uh, raise. If you would like to uh, raise the second uh, seat, you would raise your hand over the top. The second one would raise. Um, you do you do what you need to do, and as you walk away, then everything closes automatically, and then it would flush and complete its operation. And now it is ready for the next use. Yeah, you can you can lock in here. We're just killing time. We get the center seat here. Okay. Hello everyone. Okay, I apologize. Except had it on my schedule for six thirty. I don't understand why. Ben Paulson's here. No, he's he's sitting here in spirit. Oh yeah, it's Ben Paulson. Now pull that up. It is still recording. I double check. Better safe than sorry. Okay. So stand behind all three minutes again. So I'm Mitch. I'm the former vice president of the Muskie Historical Society. This is literally the only thing I've done for this organization. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't tell John. The um, yeah. So today, so before I actually like start, I think the uh, our next two meetings, which are going to be for the next two weeks, same time, same place in here. Bilky's last lecture because he's graduating is going to be next week in here. And then after the week after that, week 10, it's going to be a video day, like uh, the underpaid substitute teacher would just push a TV into the room and you'd watch videos. <laughs> Probably historic videos, because we're the historical society. But regardless, um, today we're having, we got Dr. Chandler, Dr. Strangeway, and Dr. Kelhofer here. We're going to do a funny panel about the uh, electrical engineering technology program. Do you guys want to introduce yourselves? Or? I'm Edward Chandler, and I am currently adjunct faculty member, so I'm part-time, but I have been with MSWE for quite a few years, most recently the last 25, and um, in the electrical engineering and computer science department, primarily involved in electrical engineering recently, but I have been very involved in electrical engineering technology, including way back when we ran two-year associate degree programs and also four-year bachelor science programs which eventually evolved into a plus two only uh, is what we ran BSWT but we didn't run the first two years and then that evolved into a plus two and a half or so BSWE where students would transfer with an associate degree in EBT from a technical or community college and, uh, and still, we, that's a current program, and graduate with a BSWE with an additional two and a half years, roughly. So. Okay. I'm Robert Strangeway, and I've been associated with uh, EET and EE for uh, many, many decades. I was a student at MSOE from 1975 to 1979, and I have an associate of applied science and electrical engineering technology a degree as well as a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering Technology degree. So I've lived part of this, uh, a lot of this history. After some in a stint in industry, I returned to MSOE in 1982 as an instructor and uh, over the years promoted through the ranks. Uh, taught numerous electrical engineering technology courses as well as electrical engineering. And Dr. Chandler already described the transition. All three of us uh, in the front here were involved in this massive uh, transition and today that program that brings in transfer electrical engineering technologists it, we call the EEX or EE transfer uh, uh, program. Um, I'm Dr. Rich Kellenhofer. I was hired in 2008 specifically to be the program director for the electrical engineering technology program at that time because uh, Dr. Chandler I think you were the Program, program director, director and we're uh, stepping down to just teaching. Yeah. Um, I 
my background is not electrical engineering technology, it's electrical engineering, and yet I, uh, I, I had worked with numerous uh, graduates of the program uh, in industry, uh, and I really did not know the differences the, between the two. I just thought it was a different path, which from a um, practical perspective it is, it was just a different path. From an academic perspective, there was there was differences that I soon learned as we went through, um, more from an accreditation body perspective. Uh, so that was, that's my my journey here. Cool. The uh, yeah. So now it's panel time, as advertised. Yeah, uh, I, I dropped the sheet of the questions out over there. I was gonna sit across from the room, but that's why it's like. No, I figured it'd be awkward to like stand here and ask all the questions. Good. Maybe I thought maybe I thought about it too much. Yeah. Move over, you can bring a chair here. Would you uh, prefer to that uh, I'll just one of us uh, also just maybe gives a brief overview of the history of technology from kind of the beginning? That would be helpful. Actually, yeah, that'd probably help. Yeah. So everyone's seen the uh, photos of the, uh, the MSOE old photos of people on the uh, up on the poles repairing things and the motors and things. MSOE was born in 1903 because there's these new technologies out there called electricity. Okay, motors generate electrification of America. Most of America was not electrified at that time, and Oscar Werwaff realized. We don't have anybody to fix this, maintain it, to install it. So really, MSU was born of what they called engineering technology at that time, but it was engineering technology, preparing technicians for industry uh, on that. And if, if you look at old degrees, they had a lot of different names and so forth, but uh, engineering technology has been around at MSOE for a very long time. And when did electroengineering come in? I, I'm trying to remember the, the era. It was later, fifties, uh, forties. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I'm not started. But it, it, it like engineering and other engineering programs uh, came uh, in. Ramping up to the nineteen um, seventies, as Dr. Chandler mentioned, we had a, both associate degrees and bachelor's degrees in engineering technology. We had um, big. The big areas were electrical mechanical and manufacturing engineering technology. And we actually are ABET accredited for many years under those three umbrellas. The associate degrees had actually specialties. There was a construction, a computer, a communications, and the power, and the power was the fourth one. So they actually used to separate them by, uh, especially my associate degree is ECET, Electronic Communications Engineering Technology uh, on that. As the 80s evolved, uh, realized that uh, it would be better to condense into one associate degree, electrical engineering technology, with just variations of paths within it, uh, marketing and so forth, uh, making sure there's enough students uh, on that. Then in that history, um, uh, it, it evolved to the uh, a decision as MSOE became more engineering focused. It evolved that, okay, maybe associate degrees aren't as appropriate anymore. That was coupled with the increasing strength of technical colleges offering associate degrees. And I'm gonna loop back on that in a moment uh, because it has an interesting twist in the history of that. So eventually MSOE decided to go Bachelor of Science, Electroengineering Technology, just pure on that. A lot more transfer students uh, uh, at, by that point in the time. And even that program had diminishing uh, enrollments uh, on that. And so uh, and a fateful uh, day in the late uh, 90s, my boss walked in one day. And it was the beginning of the spring quarter of uh, 97. They called me into uh, an office uh, over on the administration side. He says, hey, Bob, I just took all your classes away. It's kind of startling. <laughs> he threw a set of car keys onto the table. He said, 
please go figure out what's going on in the state of Wisconsin. We're not getting the transfer students to support this program. And then he walked out uh, on that. And uh, that was the beginning. I was terrified because I didn't know how to make cold calls uh, and things. So I, I started my travels and I basically said I need to collect data. And here's where the inst inst interesting revelations uh, came in. The technical colleges had grown from folk tech, kind of just skill type of thing, uh, into engineering technology. And really, it was not on anybody's radar screen. And part of the reason for that were several faculty in the technical colleges were MSOE graduates. We actually seeded our own background without even realizing it uh, on that. So it was in the 90s that we uh, decided we really need to make the BSET a transfer program with an associate degree coming in. And that's what Dr. Chandler referred uh, to on that. And uh, took a few years to figure out really how to do it, but we signed five transfer agreements in 2001 and have been going ever since uh, on that. It's grown to nine uh, different colleges on that. Then uh, when Dr. Tone Hoffer is under Dr. Chandler, one of their program directors. Uh, we saw the increasing uh, interest. Uh, I'd be pretty frank about it. Engineering technology was developing uh, an image problem, not from MSOE, but from other colleges that were unaccredited or had lower quality programs. Their graduates were not performing as engineers in industry, as Dr. Kelnhofer said. He wasn't even aware that there was a difference uh, there. From MSOE, there wasn't an issue, but companies have policies. And uh, the brainstorming of the, us three and a few others in the department, we actually realized there is a method to make a successful transition from an AASEET to BSEE. It was kind of a breakthrough in the thinking. Of how to, and we even have a, a, a paper uh, on that uh, with ASEE. And that uh, breakthrough came through, we developed it, and that was 2013, if I remember right. The year 2013, that was the last year we accepted BSEET, and the first year we accepted Associate of Applied Science EET into BSEE under a transfer track, the EEX track on there. And uh, when that uh, occurred, it was a great marketing data point. We had like 25 going to EE and five went into EET. So a total set the marketplace was also right to, in that decision. And then after that, we did graduate every EET. Uh, we uh, ran it through and got all of them uh, graduated with their degree. And the uh, EEX program has been going well ever since. I hope that wasn't too long, uh, but, it was, but believe me, that's a very condensed history. <laughs> let me, Anything let me, to add, gentlemen? Yeah, I was, was going to provide a little bit of an overview on engineering technology and, and maybe help describe the differences between engineering and engineering technology. And, and the difference comes down to the accrediting organization. Uh, almost all programs have some form of accreditation. And ABET was the accrediting body for engineering programs and engineering technology programs. And the criteria used for accrediting the programs was different. MSOE's programs were strong and was accredited by, matter of fact, the electrical engineering technology and the other engineering technologies, because there was more than just electrical, there was mechanical engineering technology, they, there was a civil no, manufacturing, manufacturing, manufacturing engineering technology were were accredited by the what was called the uh, Technology Accreditation Commission uh, or TAC of ABET before the program you're in was actually accredited. Uh, the MSOE BSEE did not become accredited until. 81 -ish? Yeah, it was it was relatively late uh, from a, from a baccalaureate of science in electrical engineering because uh, the longest program is Madison in the state, 
Um, <clears throat> UWM came in in the 60s, and I think they got their accreditation somewhere in that time frame. You can look, you can, you can look all this up on, on the ABET organization as well. And so engineering is accredited by the Engineering Accreditation Commission. So there's these different, these two different commissions in ABET that do the accreditation. Those criteria are, are, are different. And so, as Dr. Strangeway mentioned, as we, as we would go to market the program to prospective students, the question was, well, is this engineering light? Is this, what's, what's the difference between these? And it was getting consistently more difficult. Another layer piece in there was if you wanted to get uh, uh, your professional engineering registration, your licensure, different states, that is done at a state by state level. State of Wisconsin recognized engineering technology as a, as a, a pathway in for your professional uh, engineering license and provided, uh, I believe it was three or three and a half years of experience for the baccalaureate degree in, in, in engineering technology, four years for the, so there was a little bit of a differential in there. However, other states did not recognize it at all. And that became an issue for some, not a lot, but every now and then we had a graduate that would go off and start doing work for consulting companies. In the power industry. In the power, yep. And that was a driver to, to, to move forward. But there was numerous, again, I did not see it. I was predominantly here in the southeastern Wisconsin. The graduates of the program were, well, my, my boss was a graduate, so I'm reporting to my boss who was in engineering technology. I didn't know there was any difference in any of this. But then as I started to learn about out, outside of the state of Wisconsin, there was very different uh, requirements for the graduates in some of these technology programs. I think you've had experience in that as well. So, so that's kind of some of the overarching, the difference between engineering and en engineering technology. And a question you might be asking, why was MSOE so strong and some of these other places not so strong? Because the same faculty taught both engineering and engineering technology. Uh, they understood what industry you needed for engineers. So we have literally thousands of engineering technology uh, graduates uh, from MSOE. Uh, they really uh, are dominate. Uh, and again, they're out there uh, performing as engineers, managers, leaders, and so forth on there. So it served, uh, the program served to launch them in a platform, but with the difficulties that Dr. Kellenhofer just documented on that, you always want to do the best for your students so they don't hit impediments in their career. And that's uh, why we really put our uh, efforts into determining if there is a viable path from associate in EET to BSAA. And I think uh, over a decade later, we're pretty confident we have the answer on that. Dr. Chandler, anything to add to that? Or? Yeah, I'd like to just give a little bit of my perspective, especially to shine some light on why there have been substantial difficulties with bachelor's level engineering technology programs. Not, not that we had really big difficulties at MSUE, but generally there are difficulties across the country. The two-year engineering technology programs that lead to an associate degree are quite well defined. The people coming out of those programs are generally working as engineering technicians in industry. Uh, and they have fairly well defined roles. There's always variance. You know, some of them that are really on top of things can even serve as engineers if their company allows it and if their background is sufficient. Uh, Four-year engineering graduates from accredited programs have quite a well-understood background. Four-year Bachelor of Science Engineering Technology graduates are not well-defined, are not well-defined. There's such a huge variation in the uh, flavors and depth of understanding concepts of programs across the country, you might have, you know, there's a range of quality and depth and all that for engineering programs. Uh, the best 
engineering technology programs are almost at the same point. The worst are maybe here in terms of how much depth there is right. and so forth. So uh, one of the problems is I think engineering technology programs, I don't know this, but I think they were invented by academics. There is almost no one in the industry that has a title, I'm an engineering technologist. Uh, they get hired as engineers if they have if they come from a program that prepares them and gets them to an endpoint that's very similar to our engineering endpoint, uh, but it, there are many schools that might do very good jobs of preparing a background for someone who has a reasonable place in industry, some kind of technical position, but it's really not an engineer position. They, they wouldn't really have the kind of background. And they want to hold on to those programs. I mean, they're in a business and all of that. And because the engineering technology program is so ill-defined in terms of what its role is, you're not preparing somebody to be an engineering technologist. The original thought is engineering, engineering technologists could assist engineers and do a lot of the same functions, maybe offload some of the stuff that isn't quite as deep. Maybe. Could, yeah, yeah. It doesn't so, really, it doesn't, it didn't work that way. This so is I gotta tell opinion. a story. Okay. Because uh, maybe they could do some of the things. We had a uh, previous chair, a couple chairs ago, and he would always joke with Bob because he knew Bob's baccalaureate was engineering technology. So, and, and, and he would he would jokingly play around with this stereotype of the engineering technologist being the technician. And he would joke, Bob, can you solder this up for me? Peterson. <laughs> um, so but there was that why, yeah. right? Yeah. There was that. And I think that you know the. The institutions like MSOE that have programs with really similar goals as their engineering programs, they were not going to convince the academic community, especially those that have programs with different goals, to change. They may not even have the faculty to support something that would uh, produce a graduate that could do engineering work. So I think from that standpoint, it was really healthy for us to uh, move out of that, and I actually think our plus two and a half or whatever it is, double EX, is a perfect model. You go two years for an associate degree, that has a known path. If you want to jump out there, you're an engineering technician. If instead you want to go on for a double E degree, you are qualified as an engineer. So a natural question is, then why years back did we even still offer both if your end goal was the same? And the answer to that is largely in the realm of learning styles. Uh, and the sort of background students, some students, would have from high school um, that uh, they're much more deductive learners. They learn a lot by example and all of that. These things are very much associated with engineering technology programs. As the years... Inductive learner. You inductive. Said, yeah, you said deductive. Yeah, deductive. deductive. I'm sorry, thanks for the correction. Inductive learner. Right. Um, so the, um, as years have gone by, the engineering programs have evolved much more in the direction of supporting students with that learning style. So uh, that makes even less reason to continue engineering technology at the four-year level. So I thought I'd kind of put those uh, somewhat historical, but also a little bit of background on you know, BS engineering technology. I taught in a EET program, bachelor's level at Purdue while I was an EE graduate student there. So that was a kind of interesting experience also that uh, was separate from SOE. Purdue has an absolutely huge engineering Engine technology te program. STEM? Yeah. So, in other words, the, the short of it, labels matter and, uh, because it's the perceptions of other individuals uh, on that end. MSOE, when we really started detecting this was an issue that we, we definitely need to change. But on the other hand, we weren't going to compromise academics. So those who come in with their associate degree actually come from institutions that we have, they call them articulation agreements, it's a, a transfer agreement. They see a contract saying you have these courses at the beginning institution, 
this is what we accept and you can uh, move on in the track. And some of the courses they teach are even actually courses we help them design. So that's why uh, the program has been successful and for the EE uh, program you've seen the, you know, basically the students go into the same courses and you can't tell the difference on that. Mechanical engineering uh, and manufacturing, which was under the mechanical engineering department, uh, chose not to pursue uh, a path from engineering technology into uh, engineering. So we've been kind of the uh, lone one, lone program for, but for a very long time. Yes. Bob, are you aware of other universities that have such a path from engineering technology into engineering? Um, yes. Uh, I think it's rare. But. It's very rare. I, I think there is uh, one or two, I don't know, Oregon Institute of Technology okay. maybe, but it's pretty rare. Yeah. And this uh, very important part to address what uh, Dr. Kellenhofer just said, this path has gone through ABET accreditations. It was actually okay. cited as a strength of the program yeah. down there. So in other words, they acknowledge that we're doing it right. All right, you have questions for us. Yes, you guys actually, uh, before you start. Oh, you guys do the funny shutter business. Um, I, we have five minutes until the shutter thing, but I just want to clarify to people that uh, even though the Mitch is going to be asking questions, everyone here can ask questions too. That's how our meetings typically go. So if you have something that pops in your mind, please raise your hand. Um, and I will restart it so that we don't have to restart in five minutes. <laughs> In that last conversation, you guys, you guys actually answered at least two questions that are on the panel anyways. So, the, uh, so, were there any, like, this is actually something I came up with earlier today, or maybe last night at, like, midnight. I have a really bad sleep schedule. The, uh, so, as the two programs sort of, like, came together in a vault, then EET ended up just becoming the transfer agreement. Was there any like content exclusive to the electrical engineering technology program that doesn't, there's no equivalent that you learn here anymore? It was just an EET thing? I think there clearly was, even, you know, especially with the transfer program, our two year college partners have their own program objectives and they must graduate two year associate degree graduates who are ready to work in industry as engineering technicians and there are skills to, uh, to do those kinds of jobs that are important or certainly not required anyway of typical engineering uh, graduates and people that take engineering roles in industry. So those courses are in place in the two-year college. They were in place here at MSOE when we ran the two-year program. There was more on uh, construction of circuits, uh, troubleshooting, uh, repair. Yeah, yeah, a lot more things. troubleshooting. Um, and uh, uh, of course, we no longer have those because we don't have the engineering technology associate degree program. But they, those types of skills are important and exist in the two year programs that students here at MSU and EEX take prior to coming here. Yeah, there, cause there was there was an expectation with the associates two years that you were ready to go, whereas with your program right now, there is not an expectation that after your second year is complete, you're ready to go out there and start doing things. Right. Um, we don't have a set of objectives listed and articulated. At the end of two years, you have these skills, whereas the two-year program, of course, has to have has that to. to be accredited. Yeah. And, and there's, you know, there's elements, uh, when you look, when I came in and looked, uh, senior design was, senior design was very different uh, for the engineering programs, the, the, the word design was specifically emphasized, whereas for the engineering technology it was project. So oftentimes there was a design component in it, not often. I tracked it. Every single engineering technology senior design project had design in it. I'm, I'm not surprised. It. I knew most yeah. of them did. Yeah. But, yeah. but there um, wasn't a requirement. Right. It right. wasn't a requirement. Um, Again, though, the faculty of MSOE and that flavor and what the students have been experiencing. 
at the senior design show, if you, you didn't know yeah. it was an engineering team or an engineering technology team, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference if uh, you didn't know my name. Okay. Yeah. The, uh, I see nobody else jumping in here. The, uh, probably should have read these like before. <laughs> <laughs> You mean you didn't feed the questions to us in advance? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I did. Yeah. You guys answered them all by accident, actually. It's like, I was like, huh. <laughs> the, um, I do have a question for Dr. Strange. But, um, what year was it when your, can you remind me again what year it was when your boss came into the room through the car keys at you and left? 1997. How did you find the car? <laughs> they, oh, they gave me one to, to oh, travel in. Like in the parking lot. He, he walked away and you just had the keys. They, oh, right. Uh, admissions told me where. Oh, they, of course. Uh, <laughs> but it was a shock because I went out uh, to a different time and traveled and I had to have to figure out who to meet. Mm -hmm. So these are cold calls. And then you don't know what situation. This was, it was actually a good thing in my growth as a professional because I had to make cold calls, sometimes in a hostile environment. Mm -hmm. In one place in particular, they said, what the bleep are you doing here on that? I said, well, I'm glad to see you. What the bleep are you doing here on that? And it, it turns out we had ignored them for so long in the relation, so they had to re learn how on the fly how to repair the relations, start the conversation up, and you know, by the end, okay, 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 glad. And then Dr. Canino, former head of the biomed engineering program, had some very good advice. He says, um, Bob, you showed up once, you started it. If you don't show up next year, everything you did is for naught. If you show up again, then they know we're, that I must be serious. And I did uh, the following uh, term, the fact uh, several, all of us have been uh, doing that travel ever since on um, there. And we have fantastic relations with the faculty. And that's through now a full generational changeover of the faculty, of all the transfer partners that we have. Mm -hmm. So, a little bit of a life lesson there that uh, personal relationships do matter uh, on there. Showing up in person does more than showing up on a video conference mm -hmm. on that. That's why salespeople, for the most part, go to the company plants and they go to their customers on that to establish those personal relationships. Good, good question. From a car. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I'm genuinely curious. What kind of car? What was he using at that time? It was, uh, you know. Was that the Maserati? No, 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 it was a BMW, right? No. I'm not sure if it was a Chevy or a Honda or something on that order. It was one of the admission vehicles that they often, they travel more locally around the state, you know, for high school visits and so forth. They rent. Uh, so almost all colleges have a rental uh, arrangement with some of the rental companies and whatever the current models are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I don't remember the specific one. Um, so I guess to give, uh, did we ever cover exactly what EET was? Because some people here are not under that major, I guess. Okay. So Dr. Kelnhofer attempted, I'll try and do an attempt here. <laughs> okay. Engineering technology is in the spectrum between the technician and the engineer. Based on I'll say that kind of a language. Uh, I said, my colleagues, please jump in. Leaning more toward the engineering end, but with wide latitude, if what Dr. Keller uh, and Dr. Keller, wide latitude of what the activities are. So in some cases, it's literally supporting an engineer. Sometimes it's design with known methodologies. In other words, you're not innovating a new design approach, but hey, here's a design approach, please execute it uh, for this. That was kind of always defined where an engineer might be innovating a completely new uh, approach on that. The engineering technology did not have quite as much of the analytic studies, the mathematics and uh, calculus-based physics, uh, for example, uh, on that. The engineering technologist was supposed to be more able to operate in the field, have more of those skill sets 
from soldering to construction and things, as well as looking at what ought we do in, toward a design on that. So it, as you can tell by my description, it's kind of nebulous and fuzzy. And this is the image problem. This is what, mm -hmm. and to this day, that image problem exists uh, on that. Uh, and that's where MSOE, as it became more serious, that we really need to address this. We know we have, uh, we've had transfer students for at least 53 years. It might be longer. There's nobody around to ask uh, on that, but at least I, we can track it back to 1969 uh, from my uh, uh, deceased professor on that. So we've, we've had transfer students into electrical programs at MSOE for eons, if you will, on that. But the image issue really became a thing. Uh, and as Dr. Chandler said, engineering programs in the 1970s were very theoretical. You do your math, your physics, maybe take your first electrical course in the last term of your sophomore year. Okay, by then they have weeded out anybody who couldn't operate on a heavy analytic level. A lot of good engineers were lost because a lot of engineers learn through experience. And MSOE recognized that, kept evolving. And you see that in many engineering colleges. They have STEM centers and things like that. So that's, uh, you know, we weren't unique in that regard. Does that help kind of explain yeah, what was, was yeah, say, in between? It really comes back to the criteria that ABET used for accrediting an engineering technology program. And Dr. Chandler talked about how wide some of these programs are. And some of that has to do with uh, when you looked at the criteria, the, the, the biggest difference between the two were the specific requirements in mathematics and sciences. And design. Uh, and the design component. Yeah. Um, engineering programs, and specifically electrical engineering programs, any program that is credited by but that has the title electrical and, part, and engineering, there's a reason you have to take differential equations. It's, you may not like the course, but it is required from ABET that an, an engineering accredited program that has the title of electrical in it, you have to have differential equations in that. I don't know if they write it, there. I don't think they specific, there's a way they phrase it, but it's, it comes back to calculus with, uh, I think they may even say differential equations. Yeah, I think they can tell you There is a, there is a, a specific is. credit count for math and sciences in the program. Did not have that same credit count for math and sciences and engineering technology programs. And so when you when you have to have somebody ready for uh, work in two years, you would have seen fabrication type courses that would have replaced some of those math and sciences on some of them, some of them not all. And therein lied the, pro the, the issue is you had this really wide gap nationally of, of what the graduates were capable of doing, which again created some states would say, no, you're not going to be a professional engineer with that credential. Um, other states as Wisconsin, was, you could. Then there was another component. So you've got you've got the just the curriculum differences. Then you had the perception differences. Purdue had very large has a very large engineering technology programs, but you also had and, and Dr. Stranger mentioned one of the strengths at MSOE is the faculty were teaching both both programs at other universities. You you would not. And you would be frowned upon if you were a faculty in an engineering program walking across. They have separate buildings. Yeah. Yeah, separate buildings. Mm -hmm. You would be frowned upon as a faculty if you were in engineering walking across to teach in the engineering technology programs. And actually, I'll add to that, <laughs> what I used to hear at Purdue, there was no easy way for a student to get objective information about 
the differences or one program or the other. If they went and talked to somebody in the engineering technology programs and asked about, well, I was also thinking about engineering, they might hear something like, well, that's fine if you want all that theory, like there's something wrong with theory. <laughs> and if they walked across the street into the other building, which housed the engineering faculty and asked for some advice, well, yeah, engineering technology, that's, if you can't make it in engineering, that was it. You, you then had, you go to engineering technology. You had advisors at Purdue and other places, uh, University of Houston had a big engineering technology, engineering programs. They would say, the, the engineering advisor would say, well, if you're not cutting it here, maybe you should go try engineering technology. We fought that. We fought that because that started creeping in. I remember and I'm going, no, just, if you couldn't make engineering, it doesn't mean you're going to make engineering technology. There's probably something else going on with you. Right. Actually, as yeah, advisors, here. Yeah, here at, at MSOE, MSOE, as advisors, when we heard that, uh, we knew that more than likely that student wasn't going to make it in engineering technology at MSOE. That's how we uh, held the uh, credentials out. By the way, the, this story, I was actually at Purdue in a conference, and I toured the engineering technology area, and I toured the engineering. So I'm over in the engineering area, and one of the professors goes, ah, I, he, he told me what his research was and what he's trying to do, and he says, I just need this instrument. And I go to him, and well, that instrument is sitting over in the engineering technology building. I was just over there. <laughs> and he gave me the funniest look. He had no, no clue, and no communication whatsoever uh, between uh, them. So in, to summarize the answer to the question, the differences between engineering and engineering technology at MSOE were not drastic at all. There, there was some emphasis in the mathematics uh, and a little bit in the design, but not as in other institutions. That is why our graduates performed as engineers. And many of our graduates, engineering technology, I'm an example as a Master of Science in Engineering and PhD in Engineering. I mean, uh, I we just opened commenced the doors. together. And we uh, graduated together, actually, on that. It's a part of MSOE's history. It's not active now, but it's nice that MSOE provides a path for the associate engineering technology from our transfer partners, that those, and it generally needs to be the upper cream of the crop, so to speak, those who really discover that they, they really do like the analytics and applying it in the engineering context, that we have a, a, not just viable, but a, but a well-oiled machine working path toward the BS uh, EE degree. And so roughly one-fifth of our uh, E class are transfers. And that's pretty commendable to the success on that. adds a nice flavor because you're bringing in and mixing students with different backgrounds and, and things into that. So it makes, you know, I'll call it, not in the sense of Rachel, but in the sense the diversity of backgrounds of uh, the program. President-elect has a question. Oh. <laughs> um, so I'm a nursing major, and something that we covered in our class was how um, people like in the professional world are trying to um, like bridge the gap in like understanding what nurses are and actually make it like a point to be like oh nurses do this and they're not like this horrible stereotype so is there anything being done in the professional world of engineering technology to make it seem like less of a poor image towards people in that career they've been trying for 30 or more, more years without success yeah wow. we uh, we we mentioned previously uh, dr. Ova Peterson who was the chair um, we, we have done, all of us here have done papers on, on that perception issue. And he, he, I don't know how we coined it, he coined it maybe. We ended up getting the slogan trademarked. Um, MSOE actually owned the, the trademark to the slogan, and I think yeah. we sold it for one dollar. For one dollar <laughs> to, who did we sell it to? Uh, it was, I think, somewhere in the engineering technology community. Yeah, maybe it was, it was called the, the, uh, degree is engineering technology, the career is engineering. We had that. I like that. Um, but it hasn't caught on. But yeah. nursing doesn't have anything similar well, to that. Like you a, know, a, a well, little, degree name. A, a little bit. Actually, the, the MSOE nursing program started out as the Milwaukee County yes. nursing program. It was a three-year program. Mm -hmm. So there was a little bit of 
Yeah. Hey, yeah. you went to you went to a three year nursing program, and I went over here to exactly. this four year program. Like, so there was some of it that. Yeah, there it, there are major rifts between the perception of like a C a certified nursing assistant, a four year program, a two year program, a three year. I see. Yeah. But okay. Yeah, but that. And that then is whether you have the RN. In addition yes. to the yeah. degree and all of that. But yeah. I just think it's kind of silly how people haven't made more of an effort, you know what I'm trying to say? Like, I think MSOE is setting the example, like with the engineering technology, but I don't... It's, yeah. it's very difficult to make much of an effort when you have in the widest community such a variety of opinions of yeah. what an engineering technology degree is. And I think that's what's really preventing it from ever being recognized as something. And we actually recognize that that's a little bit of a problem perception wise with the graduates we were producing with BSWTs is they need to explain themselves everywhere they yeah. apply for yeah. a job if they don't they if their employer yeah. doesn't know what is this ET well it's like EE it's just a little and you know it's really difficult you got to explain yourself and it's like well we can cut that problem out if we're just focusing on double E, basically. And I understand the problem. We had, I know one of our um, students that we were in communication with had an associate degree in EET. Uh, he transferred here maybe for a short time, but then had a real strong desire to live in another part of the country. Transferred to a different school that had a plus two BSEET and reported back that he dropped out of that program because he started in multiple courses. This stuff was basic. It was stuff that was in pretty much covered by our quite high caliber partners with their two-year programs that transfer here. It produced a graduate that was not going to be doing engineering work. So he got out of that program. And a little so, war story on that. So after my BSET degree. I went to California to a company called TRW um, that used to be an aerospace defense. Uh, they have an automotive division that you may be aware of. Uh, it's now Northrop Grumman for the, uh, that. But I went uh, there and I started my graduate studies and I was at USC. And I'm in with the dean and he's doing the evaluation of my BSET degree. <laughs> and uh, we have to forgive uh, a little bit of language, but. He's looking at this, and I, yeah, I see you really did well. My GPA was, you know, higher thing. He goes, "What the? Pardon my French. What the hell is this engineering technology thing?" <laughs> and then a second later, goes, ah, "Don't tell me. I'll just see how you do." <laughs> <laughs> you got lucky. Yeah. I, and what we I did have see. mathematical adjustments to make. Uh, and that's why, to this day, I recommend a course like Complex Variables if you're going on into graduate school because it helps in your analytic thinking. But I was able to make those adjustments and did uh, my, quite well. My, my degree was BSEE. I had a lot of adjustments mathematically to make for grad school, too. too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think probably almost everyone does. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was going to say. Uh, uh. Yeah. Other questions or other? Okay, I'm going to restart the recording. Again. Oh, oh, well, did you go that long? We absorbed the Milwaukee County School of Nursing, and they were going to shut it down. Yeah. I mean, it was either going to merge with someone else or shut down. MSOE basically gained a century worth of alumni. Yeah. On that. I'm part of Phonathon, and I it, they mark them as MSOE alum, but they're actually from the previous nursing school. Yeah, like, Milwaukee what? County School of Nursing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. My aunt says it all the time. My name is Sui Cuttex, or she's a graduate. And That's right. Mm -hmm. Really lives in Florida, but uh, anyway, call me. I didn't graduate from there. <laughs> so. Okay. Other inquiries. What are some examples of senior projects from the EET program? Yes. From the EET program, as came up earlier. Um, the vast majority included design. I actually think there might have been one or two exceptions. And it, it your definition of whether or not there's design might have some variation too, as far as it may not be a yes, no thing. One of the, actually one of the biggest differences, because I've taught senior projects and senior design in both programs, in my opinion, one of the biggest differences is how much emphasis is placed on 
process in the electrical engineering senior design sequence. And in the EET senior project, very much included design, but not necessarily attempting to follow a process and recognize its um, um, the advantages of having a process. That kind of thing wasn't emphasized as much. Uh, so I grew in the engineering program too over the years. Yeah. Uh, no. My favorite, not that I, I like the pinball machine. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I like that. My favorite project since I've been here for 15 years, because I've done a lot of senior design, both EET and EE, was a group of three EET students. Um, both trans all three transferred in from uh, Milwaukee Area Technical College. A uh, very different group. One was uh, an uh, an adult, they were all adults, but one was middle age. Middle age. Cons probably 20 years older than the, the other two students. Um, they came up with a, uh, a cane for visually impaired that had an acoustic sensor on the tip it had three servo rotaries on the fingertips. I remember that slots in the handle, and that it was almost like a coin that could come out of the slots. Out, that would, that would, and that coin would move one way or the based other. Based on what was? Based on it, and they would get to learn that and know if there's something in front of them, if it's to the left, if it's to the right. I remember that project it was, very well. They. That was the probably one of the few projects that I was upset that they didn't get it patented. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they got they got they were almost ready to go get it patented. And they did they did their background work too when they started looking at the requirements because they had done some research on for the visually impaired. Um, they didn't want anything acoustic because they're already visually impaired are already using acoustic they can hear the the flutters and the reverbs in a room so they know there's uh, acoustic in the terms of the feedback from the definitely. feedback right so they didn't want anything beeping on the cane um, they they didn't want it there was they had researched things that were actually uh, like sensory on the the taste, which they thought that was kind of weird. <laughs> and so I don't know how they, but it was just, it was phenomenal that, that the sensor that mapped, a, this, and when we say acoustic sensor, it was uh, out of the audio band. It was on the end of the, at the, end of the uh, cane, and you know, the uh, person who's visually impaired would you know, be slowly sweeping, and, um, and one of the buttons, the coin, if you will, would uh, stick the finger so they know object to the left, object to the right, or object to the head. head. And, uh, I remember a project, I, wa I was not the advisor, but uh, it's uh, by now Dr. Travis Fall, he has his PhD. Yeah, so he had it. Yeah, yes, he had a, like, I'll, let you, yeah, I'll let you explain this. Their project, I'll tell they, they developed an electric motorcycle uh, at a time before electric vehicles were getting very popular. Uh, and they had this idea, and um, they included some mechanical design. They modified a, a, a cycle bike frame so they could weld the motor to it and all this stuff. But they also developed the whole PWM, pulse width modulated, controlled motor system. And they had, it was programmable because, as you probably know from current electric vehicles, they can really perform very highly so they wanted to limit the amount of acceleration unless you know they could program it well this is what it's capable of and let's instead put it for a typical rider so they don't kill themselves on it well by the end of the term um, and they had a two term two quarter 
design. That's what EET had back then. Although they did start it a little bit early in the summer before their fall or whatever it was. But uh, by the end of the term, they had that electric cycle fully designed, working out at the senior design show. It was out in the mall. It was licensed as a custom bike and insured as a custom bike. They were allowed to ride it on public streets. And, um, uh, and besides having the bike out there, inside of one of the rooms during the senior design show, they had an identical motor with a PWM controller and they had a little throttle there that somebody could go in and they had a scope there that you could see all the PWM waveforms and how it controlled the motors. So they had all that set up as a test setup too. It was quite impressive. Dr. Chandler talked about the process in the EE. I actually enjoy doing EET senior to se senior project. Yeah. <laughs> they you were we didn't put we didn't put design process. in there. Huh? <laughs> you were burned <laughs> by the process. No, let's <laughs> paper. Let's, let's go. Let's 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 put the requirements together and let's start uh, innovating. Um, so yeah. I, I, yeah. By the way, well, the, the leader of that group uh, now is Dr. Kratz Foy. He's a BSEET graduate. He went to UW Madison. Got his MS Double E. Served in Coast Guard uh, for uh, four years, kind of a uh, tradition, um, and um, he kept going in his responsibilities up. He was a uh, dean at one of the uh, two-year colleges. He's now at the University of Minnesota, uh, second in command of a major research, uh, not project, but of the research institution at the University of Minnesota. And he has a he earned his uh, PhD. He's also was uh, on a committee for like the, the national committees for the EMI standards and things. He's really made uh, quite a name uh, for himself. I don't remember was Brandon Stroini on that project. I think so. I think so. Yeah, they were both from Fox Valley Technical College, and Brandon also went on for his master's degree in double E and then his PhD in double E from Ohio State. In antenna engineering. I met him at a conference. Oh, oh you did? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the Dr. Strangeway opened up with some of the historical going back to 1903. Uh, who's, who's all EE e. in here? So <laughs> one of the ways the students earned their keep is they manufactured batteries way back when. Yeah. Uh, Johnson Controls, I think, bought that business from MSOE. It was called Globe U Union Battery for the longest time. Mm -hmm. um, they moved the manufacturing, well, that was up on the shop up there. And I I don't know if it's called Excite. I don't know if they sold it off to Excite now or still, but but the batteries, battery technology developed, and then the students. That was way students earned money. Yeah. You know, in the uh, power lab, you know how the, how everything's enclosed and safe and all that. So in the six, 50s, 60s, even into the 70s. Uh, the safety standards weren't uh, quite as, so one of the loads for the generator is you stick two electrodes in this trough of water and let it boil the water <laughs> as you're running out of things. Um, obviously, you uh, wouldn't want to touch any of those live circuits. Is it your class just that was asking what's more dangerous, the, uh, the, the rotating stuff behind the plexiglass or the actual... Uh, Oh yeah, that, that was that was my section. Power electronics. <laughs> <laughs> they were trying to figure out which which was more dangerous in that lab. Was it was it the rotating stuff that's underneath the the, the desks, that's covered, in, or was it the uh, the loads and yeah. so forth? I think what it sells is ah, it's only one twenty. We get hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Can get killed with one twenty. Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay. Good, good inquiries. Others, anything, anything else? I guess the question that I kind of have is like you're saying how it was kind of like into the 80s and 90s when things really started shifting, and like you know by like 97 the writing was on the wall. 
what kind of like changes like with an industry and if any we're kind of forcing that change where EET wasn't as like where we kind of saw like this set um because like you're like you're saying that um the engineering was kind of separated you know more theory and the EET was very much like the technical side of things and eventually the engineering kind of you know involves more technical things what kind of shifts you know kind of led to that if any Industry, you were chair there, not, uh, heading the program at a time when industry came and said, It's nice you're covering all this theory, but your engineers, I'm talking not MSOE, but I'm talking in general, your engineers uh, with all that theory uh, don't know which end of the soldering iron to grab. <laughs> they, they, in other yeah. words, they couldn't turn it into practice. So actually, the ABET criteria changed yeah. uh, in that uh, direction. Yeah. That actually brought engineering closer to quality engineering technology programs. Still with uh, uh, more theory in them, but that's what brought them together. Uh, the other is the perceptions in industry. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I have a theory on some of that, and it goes, when, this, when the country came back out of World War II, um, a lot of the individuals that came back picked up a two-year associate's degree and started working, started their families up. And then once life kicks in, going to school in the evening to get a further that degree gets pretty darn hard to do. And so and industry was fine with that. I, I, I worked with a number of, of people that had their two-year associates and they were smarter than any other four-year engineers I've ever worked with. And uh, I even tell students, do not, do not look down your nose at somebody based on their credential. You don't know why their credential is what it is. There's numerous reasons because, I've, as I said, I've, I've worked with people that had four-year credentials and two-year credentials. And some of the two-year credentials are some of the smartest people you'll want to see because they've, they've got just experience. So that, then that started to shift, right? So it was very common when I was growing up that par my parents, friends of my parents, the, the associates was much more common than baccalaureate. That was, that was like the bread. The two-year program was the bread and butter. More people had the two-year degrees than the four-year degrees. And then that started to shift. Um, yeah. There was, I think, I think, again, here's my theory, I think there is, I think there's pressure on all of you to get a four-year degree. I mean, I, I remember telling one of my, my, my son's friends and his parents were standing right there, go, ah, go to Europe and ride the rails for a year and figure out what, what you want to do. And they're looking at me, well, you, you teach, you're not supposed to be telling this, this like, yeah, and it took me six years because I probably should have gone off and rolled the rails in Europe for a year to figure out what I wanted to do. Uh, so I think there's, I think their society has pushed four-year baccalaureate, and then that got into the, once you have that push to the four-year, you start looking down upon a two-year degree. I'll add to that, it's industry. Technology is advanced. There's many activities in industry that a two-year credit the knowledge of a two-year credential isn't enough. Yeah. I'll give a great example. A four-year transform domain. A two-year graduate isn't going to understand a four-year series and what that con uh, consists of in a periodic signal and so forth. It just takes more analytic education. Doing embedded work, some of the embedded yeah. work. There's you, another. Mm -hmm. for, the, for the, you're probably, you know, you probably start hitting your stride on your embedded stuff when, after that third year. You take uh, what digital design in the fall of the, you start looking, okay, now I'm starting, things are starting to piece together a little bit. But this is in all areas. I mean, I'm thinking of the nursing again. What you could do 20 or 30 years ago with an associate as a nurse in today's technological environment in a hospital or a medical area, just, it's not enough on that. So that's kind of. How does that answer your question? No, yeah, yeah, it did. Good interaction. By the way, where does this uh, is this film just made available to your fellow students and things? Uh, on the whole internet. 
Okay. Yeah. <laughs> World Wide Web. Yeah. <laughs> you love to call it the World Wide Web still? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Did you have any other questions on the list, or did anyone have any other? We really explored a lot of territory here. Yeah, most of you. What? <laughs> you your, your fun ones at the end or anything? Yeah, uh, they they literally answered all of those. <laughs> <laughs> there's 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 one there's one more that I got left. The uh, what courses did you guys like out of the? They, you mentioned earlier that EE and EET shared faculty. What programs did you guys like teaching for more personally? I started off in EET more because uh, my uh, credentials uh, I had not earned my uh, advanced degrees at that time. But then as time went on, it blended, and now, of course, it's all uh, engineering on that. So, I give lectures at technical colleges, too, to their classes that yeah. uh, go in. Um, we made a habit, how many, a long time ago, one of our MSOE alums said, hey, go into uh, the technical college class and give the next lecture, whatever it is going to be in that class on there. And that's what we do, and that shows the potential students who's considering MSOE that we actually understand their background. Now, that suggestion came from an MSOE alum, a graduate of the, at that time, the Biomed Engineering Program. Yeah, I can't say that I had, I, I don't remember having a preference or liking some of the double E more than double ET or vice versa. Back when we were still running our double ET program, and all the way back, if I was teaching in the junior, senior level courses in double ET, they were, in my view, just as exciting and technically interesting as our double E courses. And I sometimes taught electives in those areas. Um, so, um, if I had any slight preference, it might be that some of the courses that have been developed more recently are more interesting to me, and they would be double E courses because we haven't been running double ET courses for a while. But that's kind of not a fair comparison than just double E to double ET. So I found them both really interesting. As Dr. Kelmhofer stated earlier, uh, some of the most interesting projects happen to Ball and the double ET uh, students that uh, took these on. And I don't know if that's just Sa chance. Saddled or? with all that process. <laughs> you know, a lot of the double ET students mm -hmm. came from backgrounds where they had some industry experience and they may have, on yeah, the average, that, been a couple more years older. Not typically a huge difference, but I'll tell you, even being those couple few years older, is more likely to cause them to think of more things as possible project topics. Because most of our projects, for either of those programs, the projects are chosen by the students. Uh, we do come up with some ideas that we'll offer if you have a team where they can't think of a project, but most of the time they come up with their project ideas. And if you've got a couple more years under your belt, maybe you had some industry work or uh, whatever it might be, there's a, maybe a little better, even just more life experiences, you might think of additional things for projects. Yeah. I, I, I don't. My experience at UWM, many of my favorite instructors had industrial experience. Um, and so I, th I think that when you have an instructor that has had some form of industrial experience out there, they can bring that back into the classroom setting. So, I, that, so even though mine was uh, uh, engineering, not engineering technology, the instructors I had well, some of them even taught here. <laughs> they were teaching back and forth. Um, yeah, and, and, and when I went to graduate school, also now I started to have some faculty 
that it was like boom theory and and I thought man they can't teach their way out of a paper bag and they don't they 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 know what those numbers all mean but they don't know how to put it to practice and so when I started teaching I always would blend in I because again I'm going back on how I was learning it from some of the instructors at UWM that could infuse that um, into the into the classroom that their experience and so I was trying to infuse that as well and when I came here I I didn't look at an EET class or an EE class they just came from different positions into that that's that's all I was going to teach, I kind of teach the same way. Uh, you, I mean, you told me something. Well, I didn't remember going, well, I, I teach the way I teach. I, I, I don't know if I can change too much on that. So, I, yeah, I, there was no preference. The, the way I teach power electronics, that, a lot of that comes from John Starr. That used to be a faculty in the EET program. So I kind of stole a lot of his stuff and added on to it. Yeah. Anyways, do you, uh, anybody else have any other questions? I have one last question. One last if, question. Does anyone else have a question? And then I think, you know, we're getting close to 6.30, so we could wrap it up. But um, my last question would be, would EE students kind of take EET electives, or was there any, like, crossing between the, the groups? For the most part, no, but that was due to accreditation. Yeah. Ah, sure. Yes. Back when I was a student, that was actually allowed. And I have, um, I have mechanical engineering technology. I have a couple of double E courses on my thing. It was kind of a free for all, but uh, yeah, so accreditation uh, clamped down on that because again, they didn't view the same objectives coming out of the courses, even though that was occurring in MSOE. I'm going to give one good example. Maybe this might be a good wrap up point. Look, for those in electrical that have had the EMAG fields, look at the laboratory that is in that course. That is extremely rare at an undergraduate level. And that's from Dr. Hollins and my practical and industry experience. That same laboratory, different instruments, existed in the engineering technology program too. It was just a philosophy of MSOE of connecting the theory and the practice and uh, a large percentage of our faculty have a lot of industry experience on that. So it's, um, it's, it, we don't distinguish because there was never a reason to say, well, you're an engineering technologist, we should do something uh, different in terms of the outcomes of the course and an engineer. It just never really entered our minds. As you said, we have to adjust to the prerequisites coming in, of course, uh, but the outcomes of the course were, uh, Hey, what does industry need? Very good. Do you have another question? Did you say? No. Oh, okay. Well, we kind of hope that uh, this uh, elucidation of some of the history, I mean, and it is history, but it's a kind of a living history, and that uh, it continues to this day uh, on that. And you know, we're very happy that that transition was able to take place. It's definitely bolstered. The e program and also at a state level, our image uh, it's been uh, bolstered. The president of the Wisconsin Technical College System was here and knew the de uh, you know you wouldn't expect it. she knew some of the details of the transfer arrangements we've been running for 20 years. That should be way below the radar screen of someone at that level, but that's because of the image and at every institution. So it's definitely benefited MSOE overall also. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah, thank well, you. Enjoyable. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for sharing your time with us too. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Good luck taking the next year. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you.